Well, hello, everybody. It's your favorite St. Basilfish. It's story time. And how do we know that it is story time? Well, first of all, I get uncomfortable in this chair. Second of all, I grab myself a nice smoke and I wear the story time old man cardigan. Because deep down, I believe I'm 89 years old. All right, notice the shirt, right? Kind of looks cool there with Deadpool. He's riding a kitten with rainbows. Had some kids help me pick that shirt. Well, you might notice that I look a little scruffy, scruffier than usual. It's because I got to take uh, some short time off from work to work on packing and we're getting ready to up and leave here um, in the next week or so and go across country to California. But I want to take you back to when I was 13 years old. I had moved from the rough part of town to the north side of town. Made possible by a VA loan procured by my sperm donor. Because we don't use the D word with that guy. We don't use the F word with that guy. I usually call him by his first name. But we're not going to do that even here. Why? Because the motherfucker was an abusive monster. Allow me to light my cigar up here. Just kidding. Because if I light this thing up in this house, Admiral Sassy Frass is gonna come tromping down those stairs, she beat my ass on camera. And y'all don't wanna see that. I know in the comments you're gonna put, yes we do. I don't want you to see that. But I'm 13 years old. I'm moving on up to the north side. Made possible by that VA loan. Because we couldn't have done it ourselves. We were on welfare, food stamps, government assistance. That's how I grew up. And uh, that I was a sneeze there. Woo, hold on a second. All right, so 13 years old. For the first time in my life, I have my own room. Uh, it's me. Three other kids, four of us together. And I had lived my life mostly sharing a room with my two brothers. My sister got her own room, and the three of us got one room, tiny ass room, caused all kinds of hate and discontent. But I now had my own room, and I had my own phone. Not my own phone line, we weren't that cool yet, but I had my own phone. And it was a headset. Like early 90s, like you saw the AT&T commercials with the customer service, and they'd be like, AT&T, how can I help you? My dog is snoring. You guys are gonna hear my dog snoring in the back. Awesome, cut it out. Anyhow, and it also had a button pad that you wore on like this little tether thing. Huge ass numbers, huge ass buttons. Your great great grandmother can see each single digit on each button from three rooms away, middle of the night, lights off. Now I'm asleep. My door swings wide open. <laughs> lights come on. <laughs> There's a breath of fire as I hear, wake up. <laughs> Look around, it's my mom. You have some little friend on the phone and you need to wrap it up and let them know that they can't call this late. It is after three in the morning. Huh? Okay. Brain is still fogging asleep, but I get my headphone on. Click. Basil here, how can I help you? So tired. It's Sean. Huh? It's your buddy, Sean. Sean who? From school, man. My brain was still waking up. 
things were still firing off to try to get me to focus. And all I could think of was, Sean. Who's Sean? Hold on. Oh, Sean. But he moved like a couple weeks ago cross country. So it's not Sean. Huh? You know, Sean, who's this? It's Sean. The voice on the other end sounds like several guttural, growly voices speaking at one time. How my mother thought this was a little friend, I don't know. I asked her the next day, she said, it sounded like some little kid. I'm like, this isn't Sean, who is this? Hey, uh, did you come outside? This is Sean, man. Get some weed, some girls, I know you're still into that. This isn't Sean, man, who is this? It's Sean, come outside, come outside. It's okay, just come outside. 13 years old, I'm starting to wake up. I'm starting to realize that the voice on the other end of this line is sounding less and less like a person, much less like some kid, much less Sean. I'm freaking the hell out. And I'm not gonna look outside. My shades are closed, my, my my blinds are closed, my shades are drawn, and I get this heavy feeling just all around me, and I start kind of panicking, freaking out. Something's wrong with this phone call, so I take my little digit, right, which is now like a fat sausage finger, hover it over the disconnect button, because I'm gonna disconnect it, I'm not talking to whoever this is, I'm here, come on out. Come on, Basil. And before I can touch the disconnect, don't you hang up on me. Don't hang up the phone. And it's several voices, deep guttural growls, yelling at me to not hang up the phone. How they knew I was about to hang up the phone? Meh. Blinds are closed, shades are drawn. Early 90s, it's not like we had the little spy cameras. I freaked out. Then it starts this whoa, 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 ah, 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 crazy evil laughter. And then the phone cuts out. It's dead. Like, beep. Brrr, beep. So my 13-year-old self did the only thing my 13-year-old self knew what to do. Took off the phone. Went into the living room, turned on the lights, turned on the lights in the kitchen. It was kind of an open floor pit, um, plan. I sat on the couch, refusing to go to sleep because I was freaked the hell out. And this was the first of different things that would happen to me in this home. But even before that, there were weird, there were weird things that would happen. And um, I would notice things feel presences, or whatever you want to call it. Believe it or not, that part's up to you. But this is going on. After several hours, did some reading, go to bed, and leave the light on, turn on the radio, some Christian station, right? That's the little church boy cult thing I was raised in, that is what I knew what to do, and that is what I did. I'll fast forward you to 15 years old, two years later. Plenty of things have happened in this time, but this incident kind of stands out. Now I will tell you about the weird ass cult I was raised in in another video. Just know that I was part of an insular group that believed in what was what I call imminent rapture theology, meaning the rapture is going to happen tomorrow, and those who believe in Jesus in the way that this group believes in him gets taken up. Everyone else is going to hell unless you accept Jesus the way you should have accepted him like they accepted him, but you can't just off yourself and go to heaven and avoid all the tribulations. You have to wait for the government to find you. You make a stand and then like they cut your head off. Weird shit. 
And I'm at this like mass outreach thing in Anaheim, right? Cause there's a bunch of little networks of these groups and they get the Anaheim stadium, pull out a big name preacher. He's given all the things. We were drawn by music. That was like the big thing that made us different from other folks was our music. We were like, you know, really bad, bad Christian music that tries to sound like your pop top 10s or your rock top 40s or all that. That's our fault. And we were just, Jesus, yeah, woo. And I'm down with the youth group and I had gone with them and it's like, woo, I put on the shirt for Jesus. I put on my shoes for Jesus. I ate breakfast for Jesus, woo, right? Music stops, we go into teaching mode. And the guy's up there and he flips over to Revelation where all the scary shit is. It's like, and dragons will rise up from the sea and the ocean will turn to blood. And if you're not taking up in the rapture because you didn't believe today, you'll be eaten. And we go back and we talk about sins and we make you feel bad for not being perfect. And you're like, I feel so bad. I'm horrible. And they're like, but this dude who was perfect, oh no. He came and lived a perfect life. Oh, I could never do that. And then he died for you. What? Your sins killed him, you murderers. <laughs> okay. But if you accept him, and, and in our way, you'll be forgiven, and you won't go to hell. I won't go to hell? No. Oh, I just don't want to feel bad that I killed him. I'm so sorry. I'll take you, Jesus. That's, that's kind of what was going on. But as he's doing his sermon thing, going through the motions, I look out in the middle of the field and I see this tall figure, lanky type dude. He was in black. And I thought it was like a black coat. It looked like a black coat to me at the time. Dark hair, but his face was pale. And I, I couldn't make out the features Right, but his face was very pale and I see him walking really oddly. And I'm nudging my, but I'm like, do you see that guy? Basil, who are you talking about? That dude right down there. Nah, man, there's no one there. That guy. Dude, there's no one there. So I did the only thing I knew at the time because I had, strangely enough, a real faith. I didn't have faith in these assholes that I was raised in, but I had faith in what I was, what I was reading. Not was being fed to me, but that shit that I started reading. I'm like, God, I don't know what's going on. I'm scared. What the? They just keep us safe. And I look up, and the guy, the, the guy that I saw is gone, like gone. And it's not like he ran under bleachers or is like hiding behind the stage, he was in the middle of the field, was there, I look up, he's gone. I saw the figure again afterwards. Angry, cursing, bearing ugly teeth, the pale face, and what I can hazily remember is, is like dark clothing, just down the aisle from me. And people are walking past like nothing. It's like that crazy scene in the movie where like the villain is like staring you on. And, like, and people don't see him. They're just walking around, but you see him. You're dead locked. I ask my buddy, do you see him? Do you see him? Stop playing around, Basil. There's no one there. I went home. And uh, again, it was weird. And I would later look into that and ask and kind of talk to my folks and they dropped me off the bastard. And he's like, hmm, sounds like uh, you might have what's called discernment of the spirits. And I'm like, well, what is that? Uh, was, you know, there's all these different gifts, but um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just, you know, if God lets you, gives you a chance to use it, just, just use it. But I wouldn't look really much into it. And my stupid fucking ass listened to him. 
while things continued to happen to me years after. I never looked into what this discernment was. Now, first of all, I'm no longer part of that group associated with those assholes um, and that weird cult, and that's another story, different thing. But I will tell you what discernment of the spirits was, and I don't think it's what he thought it was. But it was kind of a, a sensing or a gift of knowing things that aren't commonly known. An ability to see past the surface of things like when folks are talking, I pick up on the nuances of, of what they're feeling and some of the motivations be, behind what they're saying. And it has been something I've been able to use to help people, especially in my particular profession that I'm being medically retired from this at the end of this week. And um, there's also this thing dealing with other supernatural stuff, feeling, presences, the, the, yeah. there's a whole bunch of different terms for it, but within this group, it would have been discernment of spirits. But anyhow, there are some weird stories for you. Um, hopefully next week, I'll be able to share some more. Don't know, be packing, moving, who knows where we're going to be? Um, that's a fun story in itself. So until next week, until next time, I'll talk to you later. Bye.